This morning's lesson is entitled Jesus Provider and Sustainer. It's part of the Origin series, which is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter of 2013. The principal contributor is the uh, director of the Geoscience Research Institute, Dr. James Gibson. Uh, the editor of the Bible Quarterlies is Clifford Goldstein. And uh, there are a lot of other people who are responsible for this. Um, we've already been through seven lessons, and uh, now we're t talking about Jesus, Provider, and Sustainer, and then there'll be a few more, and uh, then we will finish the quarterly. I think that the uh, quarterly in general has been a, a great help to put out one particular important lesson, which we'll come to as we get further along. The memory text is in Philippians 4.19. Some of you, like me, learned it in a different version. Uh, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. For the, the king, if I remember right, will say provide all your needs. It means the same thing. The uh, Sabbath afternoon lesson starts out, God sustains the creation in such regular ways that the universe is sometimes compared to a machine that God has left to run on its own. Rather than a machine, however, a better me metaphor is that the creation is like a musical instrument that God uses to produce the desired melody. That is, he is constantly involved in sustaining what he has created. And uh, that's not an exaggeration as we shall see when we get done. Nothing in the universe exists independently of the Lord. He created everything that was created. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. John 1.3 Not only that, he is the one who sustains it all. Even more astonishing, the one who created and sustains it all was the one who was crucified for us. Uh, Ellen White says, the Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, declares of Christ that all things have been created through him and unto him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The hand that sustains the worlds in space, the hand that holds the, in their orderly arrangement and tireless activity all things throughout the universe of God, is the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. The sustainer, read Hebrews 1, 3 and Colossians 1, 16 and 17, and, and it quarterly asks, what is the role of Jesus in the ongoing existence of the universe? And uh, Hebrews 1, 3 goes on to say, upholding all things by the power of, by his word, pardon me, by the word of his power. And then, uh, Colossians say, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So it's not just a matter of that they were created, but they exist now. And... Uh, Colossians, in Colossians, Paul is deliberately using uh, names of things that were thought to be really important stuff. Uh, the implication here is that Jesus continues to sustain the, the existence of the universe by his power. The universe is not independent. Its existence depends upon the continuous exercise of divine will. This is a refutation of deism, the philosophy that teaches that God created the world to govern itself and then left it to evolve without any further action on his part. The Bible rules out such theories. Also, God is not within the creation, constantly creating it as the, in the false theories of pantheism, God and the universe are the same thing, or panentheism, God inhabits the universe as though it were his own body. God is not dependent on the universe in any way. He is separate from the universe. He existed and continues to exist independently of it. The universe depends on God, 
God does not depend on the universe. Read 1 Corinthians 8, 6 and Acts 17, 28. How does Paul describe our relationship to Jesus? 1 Corinthians 8, 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And uh, Acts seventeen twenty eight, excuse me, says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now I would have to say that other than the fact that uh, Jesus and God are united, that last text probably doesn't belong there. But since they are, it does. We are dependent on God's sustaining power, moment by moment, day by day. It is because of his love that we continue to exist and are able to act and also form relationships. This is true in a special way for those who have committed themselves to God and who are, as Paul would describe it, in Christ. And uh, it says, note the relationship to creation in the text that it quotes. We'll see those in just a minute. It is also true that even those who reject salvation are, nevertheless, dependent on God's sustaining power for their existence. Daniel made this point very poignantly to King Belshazzar when he said, The God in, whom thy, in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Interesting they used the King James for that particular uh, passage. Uh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new, or become new. And notice the reference to creation. And uh, again, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath orda before ordained that we should walk in them. Those are the... Uh, special way in which we are in Christ and the idea that God is the creator is really necessary for those two texts to be valid. With all this in mind how do we understand the reality of free will and free choice? Uh, they ask the question why are these elements of our existence so important to all that we believe? Among other things, it explains the existence of evil, but it also argues that we should uh, uh, that we should use those to good advantage. The generous provider, Genesis one nineteen, pardon me, twenty nine and thirty shows that when God first created living creatures, He provided food for them. Herbs, fruits, and seeds were the food chosen for both humans and animals. Nothing said of predation or of competition for resources. The generous provider made plenty of food for everyone to partake in without any need for violence. What a contrast to the common models for existence proposed by evolutionary theory, which teaches that human life, indeed all life, exists only through a violent process of predation and survival of the fittest. The early chapters of Genesis know nothing about that. On the contrary, they reveal a world that was, literally, a paradise from the beginning. That's why, when the Lord had finished creating it, the Bible records these words, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Didn't quite catch the hyphen there. Um, Read Genesis 2, 8, and 9. What does this passage indicate about God's special interest in providing for Adam and Eve? And uh, the passage is, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground God made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and, every, and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God made an, uh, a garden for Adam and Eve. And the culture uh, was common in Genesis that a garden was a really nice thing to have. 
still is. If you plant wheat, you have to plow the soil, you have to destroy all the other crops, you have to scatter the so seeds, you have to weed them, uh, and then finally you get a crop at the end. In a garden, you tree grows, prune it a little bit, pick it, that's about it. You're hungry. I, I can remember my uh, grandmother having a garden with all kinds of trees in it and bushes of various kinds. And we, if we wanted currants, we just went out there and picked them. Uh, it was in uh, Washington State, uh, western Washington State, where it's misty all the time and things grew like crazy. Um, if you read uh, the promises of the politicians of, uh, of that day, it was every man under his own vine and under his own fig tree. That was, you know, instead of a chicken in every pot, that was the ideal. And uh, so when God creates a garden, he creates something that's absolutely fit for royalty. And then later they have to till the ground because of the curse of sin. We've already noticed that God had provided food for all his creatures, including humans. Now we see God going a step further. Not only does he provide food in abundance throughout the earth, but he has prepared a special garden for Adam and Eve with trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. The garden with its beauty and its variety of food was a provision of God's extravagant, extravagant love and grace. It was a gift of grace because Adam and Eve had done nothing to earn it, but it was freely offered and abundantly furnished. As stated in an earlier lesson, we are far removed from the original creation. Ours is a greatly damaged world. Nothing on earth, it seems, has been spared either. Yet even amid the damage, powerful evidence of God's love exists. Nature is a power, but the God of nature is unlimited in power. His works interpret his character. Those who judge him from his handiworks and not from the suppositions of great men will see his presence in everything. Look at nature, in what ways do we see his presence in everything? Well, I may open uh, to some of you at least a new way of looking at his presence in everything. Natural evil. Of course, one of the great questions that all believers in a loving God have had to deal with is the question of evil. Not just human evil, but what is called natural evil. This natural evil occurs when bad things happen in nature. Floods, hurricanes, droughts, earthquakes, etc. They cause enormous pain and suffering, not f just for humans, but for animals as well. How are we to understand these things? After all, if God is in control of the creation, why, should, why would such things happen? One of the earliest books of the Bible is the book of Job, where these questions and others become painfully real for Job. See week four. Read Job 42. I'm not going to print that whole thing out. That's just the chapter that, where Job confesses that he was speaking above his pay grade. And then God told the friends of Job that Job had answered everything right. <laughs> so I deserve an F, and God gives him an A. Interesting concept. And then says they need to pray, and they need to have Job pray for them. Because if Job doesn't pray, they're not going to be any good. And then uh, God, ex God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, and then the successes afterwards. What does this chapter answer for us, and what questions remain unanswered? And there's quite a few there. Uh, God never does tell Job exactly what happened, even though there is... Uh, a story at the beginning where God knew obviously what was going on and could have answered. Anyone who's ever read the book of Job came away with perhaps more questions than answers. The book does reveal important truths about the great controversy, which helped to form a background crucial for us to even begin to understand the existence of evil. The great controversy scenario, however, doesn't explain every incidence of evil. In fact, to explain evil would, in a sense, be to justify it, and we can never do that. The great controversy can reveal the grand issues behind evil. The motif tells us little, if anything, about each instance of evil. Job did not understand, and neither do we, when we face such catastrophic losses. 
Although God spoke to Job, he did not provide the answer to Job's questions, nor did he explain the cause of what had happened. He simply reminded Job that there were things beyond his knowledge and that he would have to trust God, which Job did. Our experience is often similar. We may not receive an answer to our questions, but the story of Job does give us important insight into the nature of evil, and it shows us that God is not unaware of the struggles that we face. The quarterly then says, go back to Sabbath's introduction and read the Ellen G. White quote. How does the, that help us to come to grips better with the question of evil, knowing that God himself suffered greatly from it as well? And then it's a section called Governing a, a Damaged Creation. Read Matthew 5, 45 and Psalm 65, 9 and 10. How does God act in, or, in creation in order to maintain the creatures that he created? And what does this tell about God's interest in the created world? And uh, Matthew 5, 45 says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain upon the just and on the unjust. Which is uh, basically saying that God, in a certain way, governs somewhat impartially. Then Psalm 65, 9 and 10 Thou visitest the earth and waterest it, thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn. That's, of course, the old English grain. When thou hast so provided for it, thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Um, you can make a case, uh, actually a pretty good case, that Jesus was a very perceptive student of the Old Testament. And that most of the things that he tells you are in a sense a new commandment because many people didn't draw that from the Old Testament, but their roots really are from there. We are familiar with sunshine and rain, and scientists have provided explanations for the processes involved in each. Yet there is more to the story than science can tell. Behind the scenes, God is actively providing for the necessities of his creatures. We may not understand his ways, but we know he is in control. Just as a skilled musician may play an instrument to produce music so beautiful that one's attention is focused on the music rather than on the musician. In fact, the more skilled, the more likely that ha is to happen. So God orders the creation so that we often see the order and are impressed with the majesty of the creation. At the same time, we may not recognize that God is behind the scenes ordering events according to his will and intending that all things will eventually work together for the good of those who love him. What similar phenomenon is noticed in the, noticed in the following text, and then they give Genesis 8, 1, Exodus 10, 13, and Numbers 11, 31. And in every case, you'll see God made a wind to pass over the earth, and Noah's day, Moses, God brought an east wind upon all the land that day. And again, there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea. So God is, in fact, in control of winds and can use them to his purpose. Wind is a common event, and we generally understand what causes it. But in these texts, the winds occur in special circumstances. We might call them providential winds. They occur at specific times and places and accomplish specific purposes. Though they may appear natural, there is an unseen cause working out the purposes of his own will using features of the world that he created to accomplish his own purposes. In 2 Kings 20, 9 through 11, we see one of the most unusual miracles of the entire Bible. The relationship of sun and earth and day length seems like one of the most stable and predictable features of human experience. Imagine the reaction of today's scientific community if a similar event should occur in our day. Yet we must ask, is anything too hard for the Lord? While this miracle and others should tell what this miracle and others should tell us is that there is much about the creation and God's actions in his creation that is way beyond our understanding. That's why it is so crucial that we come to a personal knowledge of God and know for ourselves the reality of his love. That way we learn to trust him despite all that we don't understand. Provider for damaged creation, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, 
nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are you not much better than they? That's, of course, from the Sermon on the Mount. Even after Adam and Eve had sinned and could no longer enter the garden, God provided for their immediate physical needs. Sin brought a new need, the need for clothing. Adam and Eve tried to provide clothing for themselves, but fig leaves were quite unsatisfactory. Something better was needed, which God provided in the form of skins. We'll consider more of their meaning of the skins in another lesson. The point is that God provided for their needs even though they had fallen into sin. This is another example of God's grace providing for us despite our unworthiness. Read Matthew 6, 25 through 34, and the question is asked, what crucial message is Jesus giving us with these words? How are we to understand them in the face of the trials and tragedies that are such a part of so many lives? And the passage is the one that talks about the lilies of the field and just to sample the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. But seek ye first the kingdom of God is the conclusion and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And then kind of a almost cynical note, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. And then rather than saying, um, God's going to care for you tomorrow too. He, it says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't borrow trouble. Which is kind of an interesting way of ending it. Um, these are very comforting words. I think mostly comforting in the fact that God knows what's going on. Uh, not so much in the fact that you have a guarantee that you'll always uh, have enough food to feel wonderful or enough clothing or that kind of stuff. Um, it, is, uh, it is God knows what you're, what's going on and he will be with you through it. We need to cling to them with all our hearts, souls, and minds, especially in the times of great suffering, loss, and need. Jesus died for us, not for the lilies or the birds. We can be sure of his love for us, regardless of the circumstances. And yet, as we all know, circumstances can at times be quite appalling. We see famine, drought, floods, epidemics, and death, of all, death all around. And Christians are not immune to these tragedies either. God does not promise his people a life of luxury without pain, but he does promise to provide our needs and to strengthen us so that we may cope with our challenges. We just can't forget the reality of the great controversy and that we are in a fallen world. If you like it, uh, we're in enemy territory. Read Matthew 10:28. How could this verse, read in conjunction with the verses for today, help us to deal better with the harsh realities that we often face? I have to say, I think there was a mistake in the proofreading because if you read 28, it says, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Um, the uh, next verse is more like what I think they were aiming for, 1029, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Further study, this is now Friday. Yet men of science think they can comprehend the wisdom of God, that which he has done or can do. The idea largely prevails that he is restricted by his own laws. Many either deny or ignore his existence or think to explain everything, even the operation of his spirit upon the human heart. And they no longer reverence his name or fear his power. They do not believe in the supernatural, not understanding God's laws or his infinite power to work his will through them. As is commonly used, the term laws of nature comprises what men have been able to discover with regard to the laws that govern the physical world. But how limited is their knowledge and how vast the fields, field in which the Creator can work in harmony with his own laws and yet wholly beyond the comprehension of finite beings. And that's from Patriarchs and Prophets. General Providence and Special Providence Oh, uh, we have now switched to the book Origins uh, by James Gibson, which is intended to be a companion to the lesson. And um, these are some of the themes that are in the book but are not as prominently in the lesson. 
he talks about general providence and special providence that that God provides for some things in a, in a way that uh, has come to be what we expect. Whereas otherwise, other times, say, he does things that are not what we would expect. They, he makes the point that the laws of nature are God's tools rather than restrictions on God. Um, he says, as he puts it, they aren't inherent properties of the physical universe. That they're rather what God does. God cares even for his enemies. And uh, as he puts it, uh, if the, all the dead were resurrected at every full moon, we would likely come to regard that to involve some law of nature, regardless of whether we could explain it. Uh, the tendency to reduce everything to law. Uh, in fact, we're going to come to one that uh, he doesn't mention, but uh, that has b become a foundation for physics, but involves, uh, if you like, miracles every day. Um, he lists six objections to evolution as God's way of creation. He's been pounding at this theme throughout the quarterly, and I think for a very good reason. Uh, number one, if you believe in evolution as God's way of creation, God intentionally limits resources in order to get the process of natural selection going. In other words, there's not enough for everybody, and that means the weak will starve. God approves the destruction of weaker individuals by those who are stronger, which is contrary to Christian teaching, certainly. Uh, God used evil, used an evil process to create humans in his own image, presumably an image of morality uh, at a bare minimum and love at uh, maximum. God therefore would set a higher moral standard for his creatures than he himself follows. Uh, the seventh day Sabbath is another casualty of the implications of evolutionary creationism. If it really didn't happen in six days, why are we memorializing it? That was just for the Jews. They were a primitive race at the time. Um, Never mind the fact that Jews of today garner approximately one-third of the uh, Nobel Prizes that are passed out. Um, evolutionary creation denies the relationship between sin and death. Uh, and um, so then you try to spiritualize death away or, or you know, it's not really death because it doesn't involve the soul. And uh, by the time you get done with that, you have a real, real mismatch theologically. Now, as I reflected on the lesson, I had a few thoughts that I think are interesting. Well, we'll see. Um, uh, one of the thoughts I had is, why are some scientists so, suppo uh, so opposed to the supernatural? And. Uh, I was taken back to uh, Richard Lewontin's review of Carl Sagan's book, Billions and Billions of Demons, which appeared in the New York, uh, sorry, I think it's the New York Post or something like that, New York. Anyway, it's uh, available on review of books, you're correct. Um, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity. Some of you have seen this many times before. And uh, there's, the, there's where it usually ends. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot uh, allow a divine foot in the door. But uh, the, whole, the whole essay is interesting, and this is kind of the central paragraph of the entire essay, I think. But uh, then it goes on to say something that doesn't usually get included. The eminent Kant scholar, Louis Beck, used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. And I think that that thought is where a lot of the opposition to the supernatural is. 
at any moment, some, uh, some God could do something else. Now, most of the time he doesn't. But what it means is that you can't guarantee. And of course, we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that there will come a moment when, as he puts it, the regularities of nature may be ruptured and that miracles may happen. And I, I think that that has something to do with the almost visceral opposition of some scientists to the idea of the supernatural. Um, I would go on to say that the doctrine of providence may be reasonably indicated. I hesitate to use the word proved because science doesn't really prove anything. But certainly the evidence that we had of ways heavily uh, favorable to it. For one thing, as most of you probably know now, the clockwork universe that people envisioned after Newton's discoveries that gradually got added to by other sciences um, is effectively dead in, in physics, which is the quintessential science. And what killed it is quantum mechanics. Uh, thermodynamic theory killed it a little bit, but uh, quantum mechanics killed it really good and dead. The question that you can ask is, what are atoms? Well, atoms, by definition, are unsplittable. A tomos. You can't cut them. Do atoms behave like tiny billiard balls, just bouncing off whatever they're next to, preserving all the laws of Newton in the process? Uh, well, actually, no. Atoms also are subject to fields. The first field to be mentioned was Newton's field of gravitation. The next field uh, to be mentioned was the electromagnetic field. Um, how do atoms create fields so that other atoms at a distance can know what they're supposed to do in their presence? Um, this came to the point of, uh, is light a particle or a wave? And it had significant, there were significant reasons for asking that question. Particles behave in certain ways. You can't divide them beyond a certain point. Uh, waves, on the other hand, uh, behave in strange ways when they uh, uh, are reflected, refracted especially. Um, and uh, uh, for example, if a particle is going to deviate in the way that light does, it must travel faster in the medium. Whereas if a wave is going to deviate, it must travel slower in that medium. Um, and, of course, the, next, uh, the, the answer to quantum mechanics is it depends on how you're measuring it, which one it is. And uh, the next question is, are electrons particles of waves? Well, it turns out that they are both two. Electrons have wave-like properties. And electrons have particle-like properties. Well, obviously, uh, in the standard theory, electrons are, in fact, particles. But they're particles that have waves. That's why we have orbits that, they, uh, that don't collapse. Um, and then you can ask, the, well, what about larger things? Because quantum mechanics predicts that everything has a wave-like property, including you and me and the chairs in this building and, and so forth, just very, very short wavelengths because of our size. Um, and neutrons turns out that they can be reflected by the regular uh, spacing of certain crystals so that you can have neutron diffraction, you can have neutron reflection, you can have neutron uh, interference even, which is a little bit bizarre if you think about it. But probably the, where quantum mechanics really starts reaching into the uh, uh, classical world is our rubidium atoms, particles, or waves. Well, it turns out if you cool them down to uh, basically absolute zero, uh, you can't ever get quite there, but you can get very close. And when, it, when that happens, their waveforms can overlap so that millions of rubidium atoms can occupy the exact same space. It's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. 
that's a little bizarre. Uh, if we can't predict what particles within the atom is going to be doing, does that mean we can't predict what the atoms themselves will be doing? It does sound that way, doesn't it? I mean, because uh, even going back to Aristotle, he said the, the earth, the nature is knowable. I mean, we, all we do is, is based on that we can predict how something is going to work. But yet within the atom we can. But is that true? Is that my understanding correctly? Uh, let's put it this way. We can predict the probability with which certain things will happen. And at certain points, the probability becomes so close to 100% as to be effectively 100%. Yeah. That it will be within certain limits. But in certain strange cases that we're able to show, um, those uh, those things start to defy what we normally think of as physical law. But we send things to Mars because based on what we <laughs> know and is predictable. That's right. In, in the aggregate, things are predictable. When we get down to trying to find out the exact nature of matter, it turns out, if I can put it this way, there is no mechanics that will allow a particle to go through two slots at the same time. Um, and yet, these waves will do it all the time, and then they recombine, and then when they're sensed at the end, they're sensed as a particle again. If you can explain that, a Nobel Prize is waiting for you. <laughs> I promise you. Uh, we have a couple of comments way in the back here. Yes. I once asked a physician, a Loma Linda graduate, why a fetal heart began to beat. And he explained to me the chemistry of the matter. And yet Ellen White says, not a heart beats nor a seed germinates without God's impetus. And yet you come to Deuteronomy and it says, if you'll obey me and obey my laws, I will put none of these diseases upon you. There seems to be a constant supernatural variable at least possible in the working of science. Well, what I want to point out is that this is now considered to be the heart. Uh, if there is one theory in, uh, in physics that is considered to be better proven than any other, I think it's quantum mechanics. And yet, quantum mechanics says that all of this stuff is not mechanical, it's not little tiny billiard balls feeling the pull from something out there. It's, it, it's, it, it's fairly easy to explain mathematically. It is not at all easy to explain mechanically. I don't even know that it can be done. Uh, I certainly have not seen anybody uh, present an explanation, and I've seen plenty of physicists say that if you understand quantum mechanics, then that's a good sign that you don't understand it. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, it's not, it does not make mechanical sense. Um, uh, two points. Number one, whenever you have interactions, you have the possibility, the potential for emergent properties. Emergent properties that simply could not be predicted from any kind of arithmetic accounting of the properties of the individual uh, that's interacting with one with the other. Um, that's one point. Hence, um, what happens at one level may be very different from what happens at a different level. That should give us a humble 
uh, how should I say, appreciation for the nature of things because it gives us uh, a con constant area uh, and need for new insight and new learning because there are always going to be new emergent properties that we were incapable of predicting before. The other issue is that with that scenario in, in hand, it becomes really dangerous to indulge in a process that we call extrapolation. That means we're thinking along the lines of what we're already familiar with, the principles and laws that we're very comfortable with and we've, 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 we've analyzed them to the point that we feel we own them, even though we may not. And then we expect to see the same thing everywhere. And then we're surprised because we don't. <laughs> But what if those very principles that we are talking about here, including moral principles, are an emergent property that is necessary for our healthy functioning? What if that's something that cannot be merely predicted by following the line? from wherever we thought we were comfortable with to the next level. How are we to expect and learn such things if we are not going to take advantage of insight from someone who actually has insight into such subjects? And that means we need to learn that we're dependent on God whether we like it or not simply because we don't know everything. Well, that's part of the problem is that um, our extrapolations are always assuming that other conditions are the same and they may not be. But here's, here's the other point that I wanted to make um, is that if, again, can you prove this? No. In science you can't prove anything. But let's take it at face value and run with it and see where we go. If you take it at face value that we are really simply uh, collections of atoms that have, um, that have these kinds of properties, then what it means is that the, whoever's running this show or whatever is running this show has more in common with mathematics than with mechanics. That if you like, not only can we not prove that we're not a, a giant computer simulation, but the evidence is starting to point in that direction. Uh, how much of this does that include? Uh, it includes, well, light. All light has these properties. The light that you're looking at right now to see the screen or to see me. All sound waves are carried by atoms. We're consisting of atoms. That really doesn't leave much out. Basically, our entire world is, if you like it, not running on autopilot. There are not little billiard balls that just notice what they're bumping around in whatever fields they happen to be in that there is, in fact, something going on beyond that. Um, the universe is usually mathematical. Uh, I leave room for the possibility of miracles, but uh, even, where it, even where it is mathematical, it is not in any way that we can visualize mechanically, mechanical, and perhaps not at all. That the, that the Newtonian universe is, for physics purposes, effectively dead. We do not individually create this universe by, in other words, this is not 
uh, something that's created by human consciousness because otherwise you can't explain why a whole bunch of human consciousnesses come out with the same answers all the time. There has to be something else that is behind them. Mechanical devices, again, computers or, or machines that we create do, don't create this universe. Um, again, they see the same things. Um, the simplest hypothesis that adequately explains the fact is that a superintellect, from which it is difficult to withhold the name God, creates the universe according to his own rules. And we live in that universe that he is creating. And that he not just did create, but is creating moment by moment as we are speaking. That when Ellen White talks about you know, breath follows breath, that she was actually being overly conservative. We come to the discussion questions. I'm going to throw them out and then uh, let the uh, con conversation continue. Read uh, carefully the Ellen White statement above. And uh, that was this one... right here. Men of science think that they can comprehend the wisdom of God and uh, they do not believe in the supernatural and so forth. And the laws of nature they think are absolute and the creator can work in harmony with his own laws and yet be wholly beyond the comprehension of finite beings. And by the way, uh, that theoretical possibility, you have to remember that according to the best physics we have right now, approximately 90 percent, some people say 95, some people will say a little, but in that range of all matter is matter we can't even see. Uh, <laughs> it's called dark matter. Yes? Uh, something occurred to me the other day, my son and I were thinking about dark matter, antimatter, and ordinary matter. And um, you probably have heard that uh, ordinary matter is locked in positive time frame. Mm -hmm. And antimatter is deemed to be just like ordinary matter, but in negative time. Whatever that is. Whatever, however you might picture that. And it just occurred to us, what if dark matter is the same as matter but with zero time. If you can have positive time and negative time, what's to say that you can't have matter with zero time? In which case, neither the, pos uh, neither the ordinary matter nor antimatter could interact with it, and wouldn't even see it. Or, well, if we had eyes, well, obviously, no. uh, dark matter interacts with ordinary matter to a certain extent because otherwise it wouldn't do the things that dark matter is supposed to do. Oh. It has, for example, gravitational fields. Yes, yes, but, but not the, all the other characteristics. But we have no clue as to whether it can interact in other ways. We don't know a thing about it. Uh, in fact, to be precise, we don't even know for sure that it exists. It only exists as a requirement if you're trying to interpret the universe in terms of uh, materialism, period. Uh, but the point is that to try to say that there's nothing beyond what we can see and hear and feel, or maybe that our instruments can see and hear and feel because we know that there are things going on right now, uh, there are television programs going through this room right now as we speak, radio programs. Uh, all we need is the proper receptor and we'll find them. Um, that, uh, uh, that perhaps even our instruments are not good enough to, to find things that might be important to us even, mm -hmm. but just that we don't have the tools to be able to see it. Well, I, I was just going to comment along the, the same line, uh, especially in the context of uh, Lowenton's uh, concern 
about accepting the miraculous. And I, I share his concern. I mean, it, we don't, you know, we don't like to uh, accept the unknown or the ununderstandable. On the other hand, uh, what I do understand forces me to more or less conclude, hey, there are things that aren't understandable that I've got to uh, include in my, in my uh, reasoning, my, my thinking. Uh, original life, for instance, being one a classic example of that, uh, that says, hey, uh, apply all your mathematics, apply all your uh, chemistry and so on to some of these issues and you cannot explain them on the basis of our common understanding of mechanics. It just does not work. And so we, we are forced out of that but I don't think this should give the scientific community a blanket license for denying them. Uh, uh, I, I appreciate their concern. Uh, nevertheless, their mechanistic system uh, forces me out of that, uh, out of the out of the mechanic, uh, purely mechanistic system. I, I would agree with that. I. Let's go back to um, I should have put the, uh, an extra slide there so we didn't have to go through all this stuff. Um, read carefully the Ellen White statement above what is she saying and in what ways do we see many scientists today doing exactly mm. what she says is the question. Uh, there's four more, and I'm going to read them, and then we'll just we'll, uh, open the field completely and turn on the lights. Uh, modern science today is much better than it used to be at explaining through natural means why certain things happen or why they don't. The problem isn't with natural means or natural laws, but with the ideas that these means and laws are all that exist, that there is nothing and certainly no supernatural forces ultimately behind them. What's wrong with this assumption is the question that's asked, and why does it make logical sense, ask yourself. From where did these laws originate? And why is it that idea so contrary, why is that idea so contrary to the most basic teaching of the Bible? And number three, how does the image of creation as a musical instrument provide a more accurate picture of God's relationship to the creation than does the image of creation as a machine? And Number four, what other examples can you find in Scripture where God caused special events in what we consider to be merely for, by what we would consider to be merely forces of nature? And uh, the references to King, 1 Kings 19 is the experience of Elijah and the uh, still small voice, but of course the other uh, things that came before it. And with that, we'll formally open the session. I'll note for those of you who have to go elsewhere that uh, um, it'll be about five minutes before uh, uh, 11.30. But uh, uh, let's see, we have one there, one here, and then... Science asks me to believe some things that are unbelievable. For instance, neutrinos, as you know, they try to find them in deep caves by shooting them, seeing them shoot through liquid substance. But they tell me that neutrinos penetrate the Earth, go right through it, which means they go through the molten core, perhaps, and are not burned up. And they go through all the miles of hard stuff and are not uh, blunted. I'm not sure neutrinos exist. They defy all observable rules. Well, certainly it, it gives pause to our uh, usual conception of solid matter. <laughs> you know, in, in today's uh, world, we experience the fact that you kick something hard and it sort of kicks back, if you want to put it that way. Um, 
but according to according to standard accepted science, that stuff that I just kicked is greater than ninety nine percent nothing. They talk about Jesus walking through a wall or disappearing from the hands of a crowd. Uh, again, mysterious business dealing with space and atoms. Well, uh, just going to add to uh, this picture that, you know, I think humanity as a whole is a little bit guilty of being satisfied that it understands things while it really doesn't. Uh, we just understand things at a certain level of comprehension that uh, challenges us a little bit and we tend to stop there at that particular level. Uh, gravity, for instance, or light, uh, we say, oh man, uh, sure, we, we understand certain things about light, you know, and inverse square relationships, we put mathematical formulas on it and so on and so forth, and hey, uh, we're impressed. Uh, we know what light is, uh, but we really don't. I mean, we haven't gotten at the basic uh, issue of that. Or and, and the fascinating part is that back in the 1880s, we thought we did understand light. Well, yeah, you know, what does, speaking of, you know, children and so on, how come, how come a book falls down? When you, when, you, when you let it go of it and so on. Oh, gravity. Great. Okay, we got an answer. Hey, it's gravity. <laughs> Which so is we, just we, the Latin for it's heavy. Do we have any idea what really pulls <laughs> that book down? I mean, uh, it's... Uh, well, according to Einstein, it <clears> isn't <throat> actually pulled down that the earth comes up to it, but... <laughs> okay, that's... I'll live with that one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, I, I think uh, it, we should not be as satisfied as we are with some of our answers. I, I don't think there is good, and I think if we realize that, we wouldn't it be as, as critical of that which we don't understand, but we need, need to be careful about it. Uh, because you can go off on the wild too much, and I'm so glad that uh, basically the Bible is rational, uh, cause and effect, and so on, and on that basis I can proceed with uh, at least trying to understand things. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I, maybe we'll come up there. Mm. Uh, go ahead. Nick. Okay, if I understood you well, uh, you made a reference to the fact that the particle can go through two slots and then recombine. Now, if, if that's uh, that, what... That's a crude way of putting it, but yes. Okay. If, if that is uh, what you meant, then uh, are we assuming that the particle is indivisible, that cannot be divided? Because if it c can go through slots, that means that it sh it, it can be divided. I'm thinking about a man coming down the hallway and then going through two doors at the same time and then recombining into one person sitting here uh, in front of you. It's impossible. But if something like that would be possible, that means that particles are not indivisible but can split and recombine. Um, maybe you should pass it next door and we'll get our resident. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're, not, you're, you're, not the, you're not the physicist in the family. Um, no, it's, uh, if, if you're asking to explain it in common mechanical terms, uh, the okay. further we push these things, the weirder it gets. Um, you can take a photon, split it into two, rotate its polarization or not, as the case may be, 
if you don't rotate it, or if you rotate the other one's polarization to the same degree, they can now be recombined into one photon. If, if they arrive and they have opposite polarizations, they don't combine. What happens is you get one going one way and one going the other way, or, well, actually what happens is you get either one going one way or one going the other way as if it was always one photon to begin with. Well, what, uh, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps a particle is made up of smaller, not particles, but smaller. Nobody has ever seen a half of an electron. <laughs> when they go through two slots at the same, t at the same time, that means that they have split already. That's my, I mean. It, 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 except that they haven't split. It's only gone one side. You can take an electron and split it in, into these two beams that interfere at the end. You can put sensitive detectors and tell whether the electron went one way or the other way. But if you do that, it will not recombine at the end. The electron somehow knows it's watched. That's if you want to get really bizarre about it, you can, you can sense only one side and the electron will recombine, but uh, if you turn on the detector so you know which way it went and it went the other way so it doesn't send, the, uh, send this one off, it will know that the way it didn't take was being watched and will not recombine. Explain to me that one. Well, they are playing hide and seek. <laughs> There you go. Now you, you're beginning to understand. <laughs> it is the, the experiments are the experiments are totally rational. The results are as totally bizarre. Mm -hmm. Levantin's statement uh, reminded me of some um, how should I say experiences I had with certain uh, brothers in the church. Um, but in a, in a different sense. Here is the example. Uh, a certain brother would come and say, the Lord's Spirit has impressed me about this matter thus. And my antennas immediately jump up. Why do you think that is? It immediately bothers me. Well, there's the, there's the question of why the Lord's Spirit didn't talk to you directly. Uh, but uh, there's well, also the, the question of whether uh, self-interest could be involved. Well, you know, it's easy to claim someone else's authority for anything. Right? And I am very uneasy when any one of us decides to go that extra distance to bolster their particular view. Now we're going to invoke the authority of the Lord Almighty that this is the way things have to be. This, this can be a problem, can it not? Yes? You can believe me. <laughs> well, there you go. Mm -hmm. I'd rather ha ha deal with somebody who honestly say, now I really want things this way, period. Because that's at least the honest thing to say. Yes? Well, you know, there is a commandment about taking the name of the Lord in vain. And I think that, ah. that this is actually more directly involved with that than what we usually think of, you know, in terms of swearing. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of it's embezzlement of the authority of God. Yeah. Now. How do you know that for sure? Well, that's the, exactly the problem. That's the problem of the issue. Do you, you, you see, you see the issue? If somebody, if somebody, uh, yes, uh, if yes. somebody comes up. No, 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 it's different. <laughs> I read, <laughs> yeah, 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 when I read Ellen White, I learned something. <laughs> well, when I talk to this particular brother, I feel stupefied. 
There is a difference. Okay, now, um, you see, and this is being able to distinguish between something that is genuine as opposed to something that is a put-on of sorts. Okay, in one case, there is this tendency of wanting to claim God for whatever happens to be my preference. On the other hand, you have this issue of levanting, not allowing the divine foot in the door. And I see that both people have the same problem, only in the opposite sense. One wants to invoke God for whatever happens to be the convenient argument at the time. The other one wants to absolutely exclude him from everything. Each one has the same problem. Why? Because God is not ours to manage. This is something that needs to be firmly grasped. Go ahead. Along, and then, along uh, this same line, there's a, a series of nuclear uh, reaction uh, explosions that the Russians put off into space uh, some time ago, and they had calculated out what they expected the responses of each one of those because they were gradated nuclear explosions. And the results came back far above what all of their expectations their preliminary mathematic expectations were as what the result would be, and they could not figure that out without these, these explosions causing something else in the universe to be adding to that and making it much more powerful than what they were able to originally calculate. And I have a book somewhere in my house there that gives what each one of those greater amount was, and it's a fascinating reading about these things, so that there's, there's things going on with the, with the nucleuses themselves that we do not actually understand all the energies that are within those. We try to calculate out what they are going to be, but when we do something to destroy the nucleus, there's something else going on there that is unexplainable mathematically because it doesn't fit with our equations. And uh, this, uh, I believe, may be part of the thing that's going on with quantum mechanics, trying to explain why there's something else going on. And I think it's some, something that God has put into those nucleuses that we so far have not been able to identify what that particular energy is. Well, to say that we don't understand it, I think, is to make the point that quantum mechanics makes. Um, the mathematics works perfectly. The, the, uh, the mechanics don't make any sense at all. I would be interested, though, in seeing what, uh, the reference that you have uh, and see, what, uh, see how much backing they have, because that, that would be a relatively unreported um, bit of uh, 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 information. Uh, yes, and I think I'm going to let you have the last word. Well, um, it's, it's not very much of a last word. Um, it seems to me that uh, reference to our, our concerns about uh, those who say, well, uh, you know, the Lord told me this and that. Uh, I think there are very clear cases where God has spoken to man in, in the Bible. And you, 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 uh, the authority that the Bible engenders tends to uh, make me think this is the real case. And, and I think there are uh, people who like to imagine that the Lord has told them certain things. And uh, I think we need to be very cautious in that. And, and I think if the Lord can speak to you, you're going to know about it. I, I would have to agree with that. I think we'll uh, uh, call that quits for today, and um, we'll see those of you who can make it next week, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully we'll we'll be dealing with marriage. So that that'll make a that'll make an interesting uh, interesting subject. <laughs>